most of them were buried simply in communal graves underneath Wing, Weath Wing. Uh, well over 2,000 people. There's a little primary school just along on the left there, St. Mary's Roman Catholic Primary School, and they did some building work there recent, well, a few years ago, and they unearthed the remains of 80 people. Uh, so they were reburied at another re nearby cemetery. One of the interesting things about the bodies that they found was, they, I mean, not only were they buried in the clothes that they died in, but a number of them still had money in their pockets. Really? People, wow, yeah. they were obviously buried, people were so scared of the plague that the body was just dumped in the ground and buried over without, not, right. not exactly. Yeah, right. huh. Nobody had gone through the pockets. Right. Of And um, the people, uh, at that time, we had a population of 80,000 people. It was the sixth biggest town or city in the whole of Scotland. Oh. <laughs> and there was a referendum, should we join with Edinburgh? The people of Leith voted six to one against. <laughs> uh, the Westminster Parliament said, well, never mind that. Yeah. It would be more convenient <coughs> if Edinburgh's port was part of Edinburgh. So we got swallowed up into Edinburgh. <laughs> that was 1920. <coughs> Well, that's what then the downside drums are for. I'll tell you about the time. Depending which end of the bar you were at, uh, which end of the counter, you, you could still get a time. I kind of, yeah. They must have come under one license. Yeah, the method is In the early 1800s, at the time of the Napoleonic Wars, we took the top off and they took the sails off it and it became a signal tower to signal to shipping. This area that we're on now, I mean, we began on the crop. Uh, one of the guys on the crop was saying, you only need to dig down 18 inches and you come to really good quality sand. Oh. This area we are on now is reclaimed land. This was, over there was all sand. Uh, and from the 1500s into the 1800s, <coughs> this was the scene of the Leith races, horse races. But I mean, Leith races was a huge sort of festival and fair. Uh, there'd be fairground attractions, there'd be races on the sand, there'd be a lot of drinking and merriment, a week-long festival. <coughs> it's also where they hanged pirates. <laughs> Coincidentally, I mentioned George IV's visit to Leith in 1822. 1822, it's easy for me to remember, that was the last year that they hanged a pirate on Leith sands <laughs> as well. So if you imagine all this was sand, which makes sense of Leith links being called links, because traditionally a Lynx golf course has got sand on it, it's next to the sea, and that would have been next to the sea as well. I mean, most ordinary people didn't get a headstone uh, back in the 1600s or the 1700s. This is quite an interesting. Um, when you bought, a, generally in the graveyards, if you bought a plot, it could accommodate five people. So the first person to die would be the person that was buried deepest. Then maybe his wife would go on top of him, a children would go on top of that. So they'd basically be stacked up on top of each other. If you look around the gravestones, the ones that you can read in the cemetery, you'll find that a lot of the people were either ship masters or ship owners. You're not seeing ordinary seamen here. What's particularly interesting about this stone is firstly, it's the beginning, it's over 200 years ago. Firstly, we can read it. And secondly, it's continued on the back. Oh. If you come around this side, it's like flipping over the page of a book. <laughs> and again, we've got shipmaster, shipmaster, shipmaster. <laughs> so all these people were shipmasters. Um, a lot, I mean, it's the same in a lot of cemeteries. A lot of people that did have headstones, the headstones haven't survived. And one person that I want to talk about is a woman called Anne McIntosh. Her maiden name was Anne Farquharson. She was born into a Jacobite family, a staunchly Jacobite family. Now the Jacobites were the supporters of the deposed King, James VII of Scotland, James II of England. He was Roman Catholic, he was deposed, and a law was passed that in future, all the future monarchs of Scotland and England must be Protestant. This presented them with a particular problem when Queen Anne died because she didn't have any adult children and the descendants of James, who were in a direct line 
were all, Anne was the daughter of James. His other family were all Roman Catholic, but they could not become king or queen of Scotland and England because they were Roman Catholic. So they had to go to Germany and they found a minor prince in Germany in Hanover and they brought him over and they made him King George I. And he couldn't even speak English. Court affairs had to be conducted in German. So there were a number of uprisings in support of the family of James. Jacobus is the Latin for James, so his supporters were the Jacobites. So Anne Farquharson was born into a staunchly Jacobite family uh, in 1720, so there had already been a number of risings, but she married a guy who was actually an officer in the British Army, the Hanoverian Army. So basically, when the 1745 rising began, a guy called Bonnie Prince Charlie came over from France, he raised an army in the Highlands, where Anne and her husband lived, and she raised between 200 and 400 soldiers to fight on Bonnie Prince Charlie's side against her husband. <laughs> so basically, she was on one side and the husband was on the other side. At one point, the husband, in early 1746, the husband heard that Bonnie Prince Charlie was staying at their home near Inverness. <coughs> so he went with a number of soldiers to arrest Bonnie Prince Charlie, and Anne had the domestic staff, the servants, go out and clatter about and shout war cries and give the impression there were a lot more Jacobite soldiers there than there were. I think there is nothing of that original church left. So St. Ninias can claim to be older than not the Irish church. He could not defend his title in April 1746 because he was at the Battle of Culloden with the Jacobite army. He was the Surgeon General to Bonnie Prince Charlie's Jacobite army. Now, as we mentioned, I think I mentioned, the Jacobites were heavily defeated and John Rattery was captured uh, and imprisoned. And he was actually sentenced to death for his part in the Jacobite Rising. But he had an old golfing friend called Duncan Forbes. Now, Duncan Forbes was quite senior on the other side, a bit like uh, Colonel Anne McIntosh. He had a pal, Duncan Forbes, who was senior on the Hanoverian side.